Hello, everyone. Welcome back. So this is it. This is the last class. I can't I can't believe it myself. I've done now. This will be my 19th time lecturing online. So uh, thank you, everyone, for sticking with the class. Um, hopefully it has been a, um, a good a good online class experience. And hopefully um, for students who are new um, freshmen, hopefully this has been a, um, a okay quarter and hopefully the future quarters now that you're used to online learning is um, Hopefully the future course will go smoothly. Okay, so we're going to wrap up chapter nine and see how far we get in chapter 10. As I said before, chapter 10 homework is going to be extra credit. I encourage you to do it. It'll prepare you for the placement test. Um, there are questions from chapter 10 that are going to appear on the final exam. Um, but uh, if there are any questions, you can always send me a message. Okay, so let's jump right back into it. Uh, oh, also remember that chapter eight homework is due tomorrow evening. So um, you should already be thinking about chapter eight because um, it's going to be on the quiz tomorrow. So the quiz tomorrow will cover uh, chapters 13, six, seven, and eight. So make sure you um, review those chapters heavily on chapter 13 and six. I'll give that away right now, um, but it'll be um, pretty, um, Actually, by the time you read this, I, I didn't get it won't it won't even it won't even matter because you'll put you everyone will probably watch this lecture after the quiz. So hopefully you're all studying every chapter because it all it'll all be very important. Okay, so so let's talk about compounds. Um, so this is not compounds per se, oxidation reduction of common organic compounds. So we talked, we stopped last time talking about some uh, net ionic equations. Now we're gonna talk about how we write oxidation reduction reactions of organic compounds. So the most common organic reaction is combustion, which is what happens here when we burn stuff in the atmosphere in oxygen, that's called oxidation reduction reaction uh, or combustion. So the main products of oxidation are carbon dioxide and water. So that's why when we burn uh, fuels and stuff, we produce a lot of carbon dioxide, which is a greenhouse gas. And much of today's uh, talking points about global warming has to do with its contribution to um, the global climate temperature. So an interesting way to kind of combat climate change is to remove carbon dioxide or you know convert it to other useful resources um, or remove it generally from the air through carbon capture technology. Um, but um, carbon, carbon dioxide, you know, we can, we, it's toxic to us. So that's why we exhale it. Um, but trees love it because they, they capture carbon and fix it. Um, and that's how it provides food for like um, herbivores and for us. Okay, so general equation is you have some, um, you have some, a uh, combination of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, and it reacts with oxygen. So this is our car organic compound, and it reacts with oxygen to give us um, carbon dioxide, water, and water. So we could we could say it's liquid or gas; it does not matter. Just know that water forms. So burning of methane produces this equation and we get carbon dioxide and water. So now let's talk about how we balance it. So write the equation for the complete burning of ethane. So just like the methane example, we're just gonna take ethane, react it with oxygen, and give us carbon dioxide and water. Okay, so we need to balance um, both sides of the equation. So the easiest thing to balance probably is maybe um, not the oxygens, so we probably want to balance the carbon first. So let's put a carbon, um, put a front uh, two in a carbon because we need to balance the carbon on the right side. So that will give us two carbon atoms. Um, next, we're going to balance the H. So H is, um, H is, um, is more easy to balance because it appears in one other product, right? The water and the organic compound. So we balance the H. Now we're going to put a three on the right 
to the water to balance the six on the left. And now we have, so now we have four oxygens on the right and three oxygens on the left. So four plus three is seven. So what's, um, what number can we put on the right, on the left in front of oxygen gas to get seven? Well, we can put, um, I think we can put um, seven halves. Okay, so seven halves. Does that seven halves is um, three and a half? So that will give us times two will give us seven. Because if we times it by two, that fraction will cancel out. What we don't like in these equations is fractions because if we were to talk on a particulate scale, we can't say seven and a half oxygen atoms or oxygen molecules because that doesn't make sense. Um, it needs to be a complete number. So to get rid of the two um, on, the, on the left side, on the fraction, in the fraction, we need to multiply everything by, um, um, uh, by two. So we, multi we multiply the whole reaction by the number in the denominator. So that's, a, remember math, that's how we got rid of fractions, makes life a little bit easier. So that's what we do here. We times everything by two, and you see the seven now, the seven has become seven, and we are in fact balanced. Okay. So um, uh, these are common reactions. You'll see it again always. So it's important. Now we kind of talk about this class of reactions as well. But um, I know it can get overwhelmed with the types of reactions, but you do the homework, it'll be good practice and you'll be, you have good preparation for the final exam. Okay, so lastly, we're gonna talk about um, double replacement um, precipitation reactions. So remember, um, double replacement is a combination of the ions just switch partners. So the precipitate that forms um, when two solutions are mixed, that's indication of a positive reaction. So when we form a precipitate, that means um, a reaction has occurred. So what we're switching are basically the ions. Um, the anions um, are switching partners with the cations. So we call it double replacement um, because um, both, both uh, reacting, both compounds switch partners. Okay, so um, do not freak out about this table. Um, this is called the solubility table and it's, it has to do with the solubility rules. So uh, to my knowledge, you will not be required um, to memorize this table. Lucky you guys, when I took general chemistry, I had to memorize the rules, which is a, basically a summary of this table. So I didn't get that. So. Um, I don't know how they do it in Gen Chem, but I think they do provide you with the solubility rules. So that's, that's very nice. Um, less stress on you guys, so woohoo. Um, however, um, I've learned that you will not need to know anything about solubility because that will not be tested on the final exam. So that's something you could kind of get off your chest or get off your mind and feel kind of relieved about. But for the homework, I do expect you to solve these types of problems because they are important for general chemistry and for one of the main, uh, major reactions, we, we teach um, double displacement because it's a very easy experiment to do in the lab. However, I do not know how labs will work. So I don't know if that's of any value anymore given uh, our learning environment. But you know, as a part of curriculum, we must teach it. So double replacement is one of the more important reactions that we study. Um, so you might be asked, about the reaction itself, but um, I do not expect any solubility questions to come up. So like if you had to predict the solubility of something, we will tell you if it's soluble or not so you know. Um, this is something you do not have to memorize, okay? Uh, see, it gets even worse. The table is longer. See how, how big of a table is. So I understand um, and some people are getting a little bit stressed out just by looking at this table while watching this lecture. So do not worry. Um, these will not be required to know uh, for the final. So you're not going to be given a solubility table and I do not expect you to reproduce any of this knowledge on the final exam. Okay, so I'm just gonna go quickly what, are, what is solvent and what is not. So usually all salts of ammonium, sodium and potassium, all salts are soluble. Um, uh, also of nitrates, nitrite, chlorate, perchlorate, and acetates are soluble in water. 
Um, almost all salts of chloride ions, um, halogens, halide ions. Some exceptions though, 40s are acetates of silver, uh, aluminum, and aluminum nitrite. So those are not soluble. Halides of silver, mercury, or lead, those are commonly not soluble. Um, fluorides are usually soluble, except if they contain alkaline and earth, cations, magnesium, calcium, barium, or any of, you know, some of these transition metals, iron, iron three, lead, and aluminum. So do not worry. You just need to uh, kind of use this information for the homework, but you do not need to use this um, for the exam. Okay. Sulfates are commonly soluble, but some of them are not like lead and some of the alkaline earth metals. So calcium 2 plus, strontium, and barium. Um, usually silver compounds and sulfides, hydroxides, some of them are not soluble as we see here in this picture, in these pictures right here. Um, they're generally not soluble, um, except with these compounds right here. Sodium hydroxide is soluble, but not um, calcium, iron, or nickel. Um, so the most general of insoluble compounds are carbonates. So most carbonates are not water soluble, phosphate, um, oxalate, and chromate. Uh, most sulfides and most hydroxides and oxides are not water soluble. The exceptions are ammonium and other alkali metal cations. So anything uh, like sodium, potassium, lithium, um, those are frequently soluble. But barium hydroxide is, in, is soluble. That's like the only hydroxide that is soluble in water. So these are the, 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 these are the rules. So um, do not worry, you do not have to memorize them, but you will have to utilize them on homework. So I would get started on that right away. So um, you can get in the habit of writing these reactions and it'll be easier when we kind of ask you on a final exam like to write this reaction. But we do not expect you to predict the solubility. So do not worry, do not worry about that. Okay, so let's try this active exercise. Solutions of lead to nitrate um, and sodium bromide are combined. Write the net ionic equation for any precipitation reaction that may occur. So for this active exercise, um, remember that lead forms a solid with any halide ion. So it looks like that this double replacement reaction could be the exchange of formation of lead bromide. So let's go over that. So let's write the reaction. Lead, remember lead two means I have a two plus for lead. So I must have two nitrite, nitrate ions because nitrate is negative one charge. So we have lead two nitrate aqueous because we know lead, uh, not all nitrates are soluble plus two sodium bromide, all sodium ion, all sodium compounds are soluble. So that's two sodium bromide and that will give us, so, um, uh, so we know they're, they're soluble because it says solutions. So when it says solutions, you can't assume that um, they, are, uh, they are aqueous. So lead two bromide, we get, um, so now um, the reaction that occurs is lead two bromide because it's a double replacement reaction and sodium nitrate. So remember sodium nitrate, all sodium ions and nitrate compounds are soluble in water. So we say that's aqueous. So we're gonna say that it's aqueous. And remember, if we go back to the last slide, compounds of lead with halide ions are not soluble. So that is going to be our precipitate. So here we go, we get our equation here. So uh, remember we had the balance, um, we balanced the sodium. We uh, just remember after you write your reaction to balance it, because if you don't balance it, it'll be incorrect. So remember lead to, um, we'll need two bromide ions. So we need to multiply the left side by two, then the right side by two, because we have two nitrate ions on the left. So that's how we balance it. Okay. So here, now let's write the net ionic equation, convert everything to ions, except for stuff that do not produce ions in our solution. And that will be our lead bromide. So everything to convert to ions. And we can see here, we can cancel now the sodiums. Um, sorry, this should be an arrow. It's kind of long. So the sodiums cancel out, the nitrates cancel out. And what we're left with is lead plus two bromide gives us um, lead bromide solids. 
So that is our how we write the net react net ionic reaction. So these will take definitely take practice. You need to have a strong um, strong understanding of how to write chemical reactions, how ionic compounds form, and get them in the right um, shape, right um, formula. So I would definitely practice that. Um, you can um, you may you will see these reactions on the final. So it's very important that you understand how to do these. Um, but remember, it's cumulative, so it may be it may not it may be like maybe one or two. Who knows? Okay. All right. Um, so we also have double replacement reactions that um, also um, that all, that also give rise to molecular formation reactions. So, so this happens when we yield a product that is unstable. I'll, I'll explain um, how what that means in a bit. Um, so, so usually we have double replacement reactions that lead to a mo molecule. Um, for example, an, an acid base reaction is a double replacement reaction because we yield a salt and water that's neutral. So our water is neutral. So we don't we start out with a, a ionic compound, but we end up with a neutral compound. So that's an example of a double replacement reaction that where we don't see an exchange of ions um, for all the compounds. Um, so. We can identify these kind of reactions by uh, one product reactant is a strong acid and one product is a water or weak acid. So when the weak acid forms, we usually form a molecular compound or, 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 the, or if it's water. Okay, so let's write the reaction between sodium uh, hydrochloric acid and sodium. Um, I think it should be showed sodium hydroxide. Sorry, guys. Yeah, it should be sodium hydroxide. So this should say sodium hydroxide. Let's just write that on the side here. Sodium hydroxide. So the conventional equation, we write hydrochloric acid, HCl. So it says solution. So we put aqueous. HCl, sodium hydroxide, gives us water and sodium chloride. So as you see here that on one of our equations is water. So that's our molecular product. So our total ionic equation, we're going to separate everything into ions. That is aqueous, H plus, Cl minus, and then the, um, the rest. And then we don't separate water because it's liquid. It's not an ion, uh, or it doesn't separate to ions. So we just leave it as water. And then we get sodium chloride, uh, sodium, uh, chloride as its ions. Now uh, we can write the net ionic equation. We cancel out all these spectators. And what we're left with is our, equi our net ionic equation. So we just write what's left over. And what we get is protons combining with hydroxide ion to get form water. So that's how our acid-base reactions work. Acids and bases react with each other, and they produce water and, uh, and a salt when we have strong acid, strong base. OK. So we don't need. Um, So it should be two, no, 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 sorry. It's, it's already balanced. Two hydrogens on the left, two on the right, and then two oxygens or one oxygen on both sides. So that's correct. Okay, so um, I won't worry too much about these reactions, but um, these are reactions that lead to products you would not expect at first glance because they are double replacement. So these are the products that form unstable. These are the reactions that form unstable products. So if you ever mixed, like, if you did the classic volcano experiment with baking soda and acetic acid, you'll notice that you get a huge uh, vigorous reaction that kind of spews, uh, spews the chemicals out of the, uh, of the volcano. And that's because we're reacting, uh, we're forming carbonic acid. And the thing about carbonic acid, uh, shown in this first equation, you, you, react, to, you react carbonate, sodium, uh, sodium carbonate, sodium bicarbonate, with acid to form carbonic acid. Carbonic acid is very unstable um, because it spontaneously releases CO2 gas and water. So every time you form carbonic acid, you're going to get this as your final product. And that's because it can eject a gas which is thermodynamically more favorable um, because it's more stable. If we emit a gas molecule, from an unstable compound. So these compounds are very unstable. The same thing with sulfur um, 
if we have not sulfate, so it doesn't happen with sulfuric acid, but sulfurous acid, um, that um, gives rise to the ejection of sulfur dioxide. Um, so the SO2 variant of carbon dioxide and water. So it's the same process, but just with the sulfur, sulfur, uh, sulfur analog. So it happens with sulfur and carbonate. So I, um, these will appear on the homework. So um, just take a look at this slide if you're ever in trouble, but if we form either of these two acid forms of SO3 and CO3, we meet, we decompose to water and their gases. Um, I think this should be a gas. Sulfur, sulfur dioxide, I don't think it's a, a, it's a liquid. So I think that should be a gas. Sorry about that. Um, lastly, there's, a, there's another reaction that occurs. If you ever, if you ever um, seen, uh, if you ever worked with ammonium hydroxide, um, it, it's very smelly. And I would not recommend smelling it. Um, always work with chemicals and infusion, but uh the reason why it smell um this compound right here doesn't smell the reason why this solution would smell is because it decomposes to ammonia and water so um ammonia is weakly basic so it'll weakly grab a proton to form ammonia hydroxide but it doesn't like to stay in that form because it's a it's a weak acid it's a weak base so what it does like to form is ammonia that's why it smells so bad the solution and your nose can immediately detect it. So it's a very smelly solution. And that's why it's because um, the, major, the major equilibrium or the, ma uh, the major most stable product is ammonia NH3 aqueous plus water. So that's the nitrogen version, ammonium, ammonium hydroxide um, converts to ammonia and water. Okay, so let's try this one, right? The reaction between solution of sodium carbonate and hydrochloric acid. So much of the same thing we did last time. We write sodium carbonate. So matter carbonate is CO3 two minus. So we put sodium, two sodiums in the front right here, plus HCl, hydrochloric acid, aqueous. And so it's a double replacement reaction. So sodium. Um, so it's actually, um, it may not seem, okay, yeah, it's, it's a double replacement reaction, right? So sodium will combine with the chloride, we get sodium chloride. But remember, the carbonate will react with two equivalents of hydrogen ion to form H2CO3. So immediately it forms this first, right? But this is unstable, so we go directly to CO2 and water, and that's the final, um, that's the final reaction we see. So how we would write this is total ionic equation. Let's just... Um, So let's just uh, replay this. Sorry, guys. Like so. So the conventional equation is right there. Total ionic, we separate everything that is water soluble. Sodium carbonate, sodium ions, carbonate ions. Then we write the 2H plus and HCl. And so this is our total ion equation. So remember, we do not write specifically carbonic acid in this case, even though we know that's is what should form. And that's because it's unstable, so we cannot say it exists in solution. So here we cancel out all our spectator ions. Carbonate will, will not cancel. Sorry about that. Um, so this should, this should be OK. Sorry. Um, and then. The chloride will cancel, right? So those are our spectator ions. And what we're left with is carbonate reacts with two protons, um, but we don't form car uh, carbonic acids. Instead, we form carbon dioxide and water because that's the stable product it decomposes into. So this is the one type of question I think will kind of trip people up. So give this one considerable amount of time to review um, by doing the homework. So we're good. Everything's balanced on both sides of the equation. Um, so the last thing we'll go over is double replacement reactions with undissolved reactants. 
So it could be compounds that don't necessarily dissolve in um, dissolve in aqueous solution. So they appear as a they appear as a separate phase. Let's talk about that. Uh, so let's talk about that by doing the uh, one last reaction. So let's describe the reaction between salt, aluminum, hydroxide. Because remember, hydroxides are not really soluble, but they'll, they'll react in um, they'll react in double replacement reaction with like acids. So I think we went over that. Um, so we can actually do reactions even though they're not soluble in water. We can react them with acids to make them go forward. Okay, so let's try this one. Uh, hydrochloric acid seems like that's our favorite acid in these exercises. So remember, aluminum hydroxide, aluminum three plus. So we need three hydroxide ions because each hydroxide ion is one minus and it dissolves in HCl. So what we say is that the solid aluminum has the solid sign and we have hydrochloric acid, which is aqueous. So remember, this is an acid base reaction. You have a strong base hydroxide and strong acid H plus. So we get water plus a salt. So in this case, we have water molecule plus aluminum chloride, which is soluble in, uh, which is aqueous and soluble. Okay, so the total ionic equation, let's separate them. Remember when it's a solid, we do not separate the aluminum um, hydroxide because it's not aqueous. So we have three H plus three Cl minus plus aluminum hydroxide, that stays the same, gives us water, aluminum, and three chloride ions. So let's cancel out um, the spectator ions, which are those, nothing else can cancel out. So we get our net ionic equation of the aluminum hydroxide reacting with uh, protons or um, H plus ions or, or, or H plus ions of the acid to give us water and aluminum in solution. So this is an example where we have some reaction going on, but necessarily the solid doesn't dissolve, but it can still react in acid. Okay, so now we have other double displacement reactions. So let's try this one. Sodium chloride and potassium nitrate. So double replacement. So we're gonna swap partners here. So our solution is sodium chloride. And potassium nitrate. So we know those are both soluble, but if we take if we exchange partners, we get sodium we get um, sodium nitrate and potassium chloride, which is, should be puzzling because those are all soluble too. So um, so the the total net ionic equation, everything's going to cancel out. So when everything cancels out like that, we say there's no reaction and all that exists in solution is just these free flowing ions. So the ions don't do anything to form a chemical change or show a chemical change. We say no reaction. So there's no net equation. So we say no reaction here. Okay, this is a summary of all the net ionic equations. I would take a look at, um, I would take, I wouldn't, um, I would not look at this chart and just do the homework because it'll, it'll be a good review. This chart will just get everyone stressed out. So I, do, I would not recommend looking at this chart. Okay, so let's use the last 20 minutes we have to go over chat, whatever we can in chapter 10. So there's only, there's a few things I just want to go over and maybe do one or two exercises and that'll be the level I expect you guys to know. So let's go forward. So hopefully that wasn't too fast for chapter nine. The homework will definitely um, be a way to do the, uh, to review and practice this material. Okay, so let's go. The last chapter for this class is chapter 10. And chapter 10, what a chapter it is. So chapter 10 is called Quantity Relationships and Chemical Reactions. So we're going to talk about stuff called the limiting reactant, limiting reagent, and um, percent yields, and how we can use these relationships um, to predict, um, like what kind of, what how we can do chemical reactions, and how we can create new, new, um, new materials and new, new products. Okay. Okay. So. 
one thing we have to get uh, down right away is that when we look at a chemical reaction, we can um, we can uh, we can create several factor conversion factors to convert one um, quantity of one one compound to another, for example, and that is all related to the coefficients in front of the species. So, for example, if we can set a relationship that says five moles of oxygen will react with four moles of ammonia given by the chemical equation. And you can do that the same for every other reactant and product. So we can do that for nitrogen oxide and also oxygen and water. And we can do that, do that for the, um, also for any other combination of reactant and product. For example, ammonia and oxygen, nitrogen, nitrogen oxide and O2, and HO and oxygen. So we can also we can always use um, the the equate the uh, the conversion factor depending on what we want. So the first one, so you see, uh, as we list them from top to bottom, they're just the inverse of each other. So it depends on what you want at the end. So we'll do some examples of this. So if we have three point two moles of ammonia, and according to the equations, how many moles of water will we produce? So how can we figure that out? Well, we use the chemical equation because that is our guiding, guiding, uh, guiding light for solving these uh, problems. So we get 3.20 moles of ammonia. Now we use our mole fraction. Our equation is right here. So just recall our chemical equation is right here. And what we want is moles of oxygen. So, so our conversion factor is we want moles of oxygen. Um, so we want, we want, um, no, it's moles of water. Sorry, it's just say moles of water. I don't know why it says moles of oxygen. So we want moles of water. So we know our conversion factor based on the chemical equation is six moles of water on top and four moles of ammonia on the bottom. So we use that conversion factor and we multiply through, we get 4.8 moles um, water at the end. So using the chemical equation, we can convert from one mole of one substance to a mole of another substance. Okay, so, um, so we can convert from particular quantities between both reactant and products and also using um, the equation as a mole ratio to give us our quantity in moles. So, so how do we um, do this for maybe an application? Okay, so how do we, how many moles of oxygen are required to burn 2.4 moles of ethane? So first we have to balance the equation. So we write a balanced chemical equation. And um, this is similar to what we did last, uh, last, in the last chapter, we already balanced it. So we have moles of ethane and we know the ratio is, um, seven moles of oxygen to two moles of ethane. So we're gonna use that ratio to convert here. So we know seven moles of oxygen is equal to two moles of ethane based on our chemical formula. So we can, we can use, this, use this as a conversion factor. So now we just multiply through, cancel out ethane, and what we're left with is moles of oxygen. So we can use the chemical equation to do these types of calculations. So we're kind of picking off, uh, picking up where we left off in chapter seven, um, when we talk about mole, mole and mass conversions. So you could do this mental check, but um, I, do not, I do not recommend it as long as your units cancel because it's just extra work. Okay, so so we can convert from mass of our given to moles of given or moles wanted to mass wanted. We just have to carry out a, another, uh, another couple steps using the molar mass. So we have the mass wanted, mass given. Um, we can convert it to moles given, then convert it to the moles wanted, then convert it to the mass wanted. Because we, we, we will know um, uh, we will know the mass because we, we know, we already know how to do this from our molar mass calculations. Okay.
Um, so, the, so the mass, the mass stoichiometry, we're going to change the mass to moles first because we, to use the um, chemical equation, the mole ratio, we need to convert everything to moles. So convert mass to moles, then convert the, the moles to what you want, the moles of what you want using the chemical equation, then change that using the molar mass to get to the mass of what you want. Change the moles to mass. So we can use this to kind of um, now interchange between, uh, and if we want to go to quantity of particles, we can now use uh, Avogadro's number to do that and what we learned in chapter seven. So we're, now we're, we're kind of applying what we learned in chapter seven to chemical reactions. Okay. So this is where it gets tricky. And the reason it gets tricky um, is because um, it's because people, it gets tricky because we're talking about chemical reactions now. Um, and people get troubled by, by utilizing the chemical reaction. So we're going to just combine everything we learned up to this point to kind of solve these questions. So first we need to write the reaction. So how many milligrams of nickel two chloride are in a solution? Uh, are in a solution if 503 milligrams of silver chloride is precipitated in the reaction of silver nitrate and silver nickel two chloride solution. So first, you just want to ignore everything you just read and just focus on this what it says reaction. So we're going to write that first as our left side of our chemical reaction. So. Silver nitrate, remember silver is plus one, nitrate. So silver nitrate, just one nitrate. And nickel two chloride. So if it's nickel two, that means chloride, there should be two of them because nickel is two plus and chloride is only negative one. So we need two of them. So we see here that we have, and then uh, once we once we know what's on the left side, we can read back on what's on the right side. So we know that nickel two chloride is what's per, uh, so nickel two chloride um, that is our reactant, and it says if five hundred three milligrams of silver chloride is precipitated, so we know silver chloride is the one of the products. So it's a double replacement reaction. We have silver chloride that's our precipitate here. And then the other product is nickel nitrate, which just forms in solution. So we know that doesn't form a solid, so we don't have to worry about that. So what we want is nickel chloride. So what mass of nickel chloride must have been present to precipitate um, 503 milligrams of silver chloride? So we start with silver chloride, and what we want is nickel chloride at the end. So you can always keep the units the same. So you don't have to convert milligrams to grams. You can if you want. So we know that from the chemical equation, once we balance it here, that one millimole nickel chloride. So when we work in milligrams, we're now going to work on the millimole scale, just like how gram scale is on the molar scale. So one millimole nickel chloride equals two millimole silver chloride. So that is our relationship here. So, and we know, so now we have to use the molar mass. So when we converting from moles to mass, use the molar mass. So that is our, our relationship, 129.59 milligrams, nickel to nickel chloride is one millimole. So these are our relationships. We have one millimole of silver chloride. That's the molar mass is 143.4. So to convert to moles, we need to get it, get use the molar mass, and then we would use the mole ratio in the middle here to get to the moles of nickel chloride. Then finally, we can multiply that by the molar mass of nickel chloride, and that'll give us our desired mass. So we just plug and chug everything here, and the units cancel, and what we're left with is our value for nickel chloride. Okay, so this is a lot to go through, so I will take it step by step, but essentially you're using the chemical equation to convert one value in mass to another uh, compound in mass, so you're doing a mass to mass conversion. Okay, so this is one of the topics I want to touch upon, yield, so ideal yield, actual yield, and percentage yield. 
So the ideal yield is the amount of product that we can form from the complete conversion of a chemical reaction. Uh, so we're given a, a amount of reactant to product, and the ideal yield is the complete conversion of reactant to product. So it's calculated based on stoichiometric principles or based on the last activity we just did or active exercise. Actual yield is the, um, the measurement of something you measure in the lab determined by experiment. So actual yield will always be lower than ideal because you can't completely isolate all the mass because of um, the law of diminishing returns. So like if you try to scrape, you know, you try to scrape all the yogurt from the bottom of a cup, you know, you're not going to uh, get all of it out, right? Because some of it's going to stick to the container and you just can't get all of it out, it, it, no matter how hard you try to scrape it. So that's what actual yield is. It'll always be less than ideal. So your yield should always be less than 100. Um, so actual yield, it can, it can be um, other things that affect you in what you actually get from a reaction when you actually do the experiment is um, you can also have impure substances, incomplete reactions, or side reactions. But a lot of time, you don't get 100% because um, sometimes you just can't isolate everything. Um, but usually um, the decreases in actual yield are caused by impure impurities, incomplete reactions or side reactions. So now um, percentage yield is the ratio of actual yield over ideal times 100. So the percent yield tell you how efficient a reaction was or how good a reaction is. So if you ever do like chemical synthesis, your percent yield is how you convey um, how well your reaction worked and how well, you know, like a synthetic route was good at getting to a target compound. So this percent yield is always reported um, in the chemical sciences. All right, so let's try this. A solution containing 3.18 grams of barium chloride is added to a solution containing excess sodium sulfate. So we know that barium sulfide sulfate precipitates. So now we want to calculate the ideal yield and um, if the actual yield is 3.37 grams, we're going to calculate the percent yield. So, so let's, let's talk about the chemical reaction. We want to go from grams to grams of barium sulfate, grams of barium chloride, barium sulfate. So when you convert the moles, use the mole ratio to get the moles of barium sulfate, then convert it to grams of barium sulfate. So let's list down our molar masses here. Now let's talk about the chemical equation. So barium chloride um, plus sodium sulfate. So remember, we said those reactions mix, so they're both aqueous and barium sulfate precipitates. So it's another double replacement reaction. And the other reaction that, the other product that forms is exchanged for sodium chloride, which is um, the other product. So that is aqueous. So now we have our balanced chemical equation, just make sure everything's balanced. And now we can see that one mole of barium sulfate will give us one mole barium chloride. So the moles that you calculate for barium chloride will be the, 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 moles, the moles you have for barium sulfate because their ratios are equal. The barium sulfate has that molar mass. So now we're going to cancel um, our units here and do um, the stoichiometry um, uh, calculation. Just make sure everything cancels and you're left with moles, I mean, grams of barium sulfate. And at the end, we should have 3.56. So now the second part is percent yield. So what we calculate right now, that goes on our ideal yield. So we're going to take our value from beginning 3.37, what we're given, divided by our theoretical. And we see we have a pretty good yield of 94.7%. So that is a pretty good yield. So that is an example of how we would calculate theoretical yield, um, or sorry, a theoretical yield based on our ideal yield from stoichiometry. So this whole chapter where we convert from one product to another or determine yields and stuff, that's called stoichiometry. And I think it's one of the hardest subjects um, to understand. That's why we're, we're teaching it right now to get you prepared for Gen Chem. Okay. So let's try this example. Solid sodium nitrate decomposes to solid sodium nitrate. 
and oxygen gas upon heating. So one set of reaction conditions gives a 95% yield. So what mass of sodium nitrate will be produced by the decomposition of 1.5 grams of sodium nitrate? So let's write our chemical reaction. So we are given 1.5 grams sodium nitrate. And what we want is sodium nitrite's mass. So remember, we just go through this same procedure, grams of sodium nitrate to moles, then use that mole ratio to get the nitrite, then convert that mole to grams. And then we can uh, use the ideal uh, theoretical yield calculation to figure out the actual yield. Uh, right, so we can use that to get the um, grams uh, ideal, and then we can figure out the actual grams of nitrite that we produced. Okay, so that's the molar mass. Like here, this is the balanced chemical equation. We generate sodium nitrite by heating it, and see it's a two to two mole ratio, so they're equal. So um, 95 grams sodium nitrate actual. Well, um, so that percentage means that 95 grams of sodium nitrate will be equal to the 100 grams that uh, would have been an ideal yield. We received 95 grams back. So that's the translation of that percentage. So now we can actually use that percentage to figure out um, the actual mass we, we get. So we convert grams sodium nitrate to moles, then use the moles to convert to nitrite, then times the molar mass to get the grams ideal, then we're going to times by the fraction 95 over 100 to now cancel out our theoretical yield and we end up with our actual yield, which is 1.2 grams. So that's another way of doing it. Um, so this is another way we can figure out the yield. Um, based on the theoretical yield that we reported. Okay. Okay, so we're going to go over limiting reactants and um, I'm going to try to get to an exercise. So this may go over a little bit long, but I just want you guys to know this because um, it's important, like very important. That's why I made chapter 10 horn optional because this, this is going really fast. So hopefully it won't take more than, you know, maybe uh, five or 10 minutes. Okay, so the last thing we'll cover is limiting reactants. What is limiting reactants? Well, in a reaction, one, one reactant is going to get consumed first. So it's, it's going to limit or, or give like, um, it's going to put a, like, a, a, like a hold on the reaction. So the reaction will stop once this reactant is consumed. So it's the reactant that is first consumed in their, um, in a reaction. So sometimes it's easy to see which reactants is consumed first, sometimes it's not. And we're going to go into the mass and how you determine this. So the limiting rea reactant determines the whole possible yield you can get because once it's consumed, you can't form more product. So the excess reactants is the, um, the reactant that doesn't get consumed, so it's an excess. So there always one reactant will be consumed first. Um, Sometimes there's no limiting reactant, but that's really rare um, for like test questions. So usually we always specify a limiting reactant. Um, so individual particles cannot be counted. Uh, so that doesn't count. So usually we say we measure it in terms of moles. So we can't really count particles, but we can count moles and that's what we use. Okay. So for example, here we have three carbon atoms react with two molecules of oxygen to form carbon dioxide. So which one is the limiting reaction? Well, you can see on the right side that two oxygen atoms are going to react with two carbon atoms. And then that's it because there's no more oxygen atoms left. So uh, what we're left with is what we're left with is at the end two CO2 molecules that form from these two oxygens and two carbon atoms. And what's left over is one carbon atom. So carbon is an excess and oxygen is our limiting reactants. So see how the reaction can no longer go if there's no oxygen present. So that is a, that's our particular representation of limiting, limiting reactant. 
So we can summarize it right here in this little table here, moles at start. And then we see here that we use two oxygen atoms because that was the limiting reactant. So that goes to zero. And what we're left over is one carbon atom and two molecules of CO2. So you can, you can always organize these things into um, a little chart like this. But I'm going to show you a way where you don't really have to do that because um, it's not necessary. OK. All right. So these are, there's two ways I'm going to show you how to solve limiting reactants. And then um, we'll go over examples and then that'll be it. So I, I'm sorry if I'm running long. I didn't, I don't mean to take long. Um, it's just that uh, this is an important concept and it's really tricky. So I want to get, get, give you the help um, that you need to do, to, uh, to be able to kind of uh, figure this out on, on you know exams, on placement tests, et cetera. Um, but you know, um, this will be where I'll stop. So I won't go any further in the chapter after um, these two methods um, because um, this is what you'll be expected to know. And um, there won't be uh, there won't be any questions tested beyond this. Okay. So to figure out the uh, limiting reactant, what you want to do is you're going to compare the moles. So first you convert the number of grams of each reactant to moles. So we already know, we know how to do that, right? We convert the moles, identify the limiting reactant. So to identify it, uh, we calculate the number of moles of each species that reacts or produce. So I'll go over what that means. And then we calculate the number of moles of each species that remains after reaction. And um, then we change the number of moles of each species to grams uh, to get, um, to see how much we have. Okay, so let's calculate the mass of antimony 3 iodide that can be produced by the reaction of antimony and 381 grams of iodine. So usually I don't ask this question, the second question, like also uh, find the mass in grams of the element that will be left. I usually don't ask that. So usually that is um, left to, um, for the homework you'll be asked to do that, but usually I don't ask that type of question in like um, exams. Okay. So let's convert each, each, mol, each compound to moles. So we see here, we convert everything to moles using molar mass. Remember, iodine is I2, not just I. Don't make that mistake. OK, so we see here in our table at the start, we had 1.06 moles of antimony and 1.5 grand moles of iodine. So, we need to figure out which one's the limiting reactant. And so what we do is the following. So let's balance the chemical reaction. So it's SB plus I2 gives us SBI3. So that was kind of translated or provided in our information. So make sure you balance the equation. So the easiest thing to do is just balance the antimony. Well, balance the iodine first. So six, then two for the antimony. So what you want to do is you want to take the moles of one compound and use the mole fraction or mole ratio to get it to the moles of the other compound. So once you have the moles of the iodine, you think to yourself, oh, I need this amount of iodine to completely react with my antimony. Do I have that amount of iodine? So, so no, we do not. So we only have 1.50 mole of iodine available. So that is less than what we need to react completely with antimony. So I2 must be the limiting reactant because it gets consumed first. So what it's saying is if I had 5.9 moles of iodine, then my antimony would re run out first. Uh, of course, if you had like equal amounts of both, um, that, um, that's probably not going to be the case. Um, pro probably just probably not because that's just too perfect. Um, sometimes it does happen, but usually it does not. So this is the mole by mole comparison example. So, so now we know that it requires 1.59 moles of iodine. So if we subtract 1.59, um, so no, so now we have to, um, so now we have, now we know the limiting ratio is iodine. We need to convert that to moles of antimony. So we know how many antimony, how many moles of antimony is used. So we can calculate the excess reagent. So we know that from there, we can use the chemical equation. 
mole fraction, get to moles of antimony. Then we're going to change our moles to grams. So, so one, one minus 1.06 gives us a, a ratio uh, difference of 0 0.06. So convert that to grams to figure out your excess amount of antimony in grams. And then we see here that since our iodine gets consumed is our limiting reagent, we only form um, we only form one uh, since the ratio between iodine and antimony and uh, between antimony iodide is the same. We see here that we get the same uh, moles produced here. So what we get at the end is one mole of antimony iodide. Um, and that gives us no more iodine because that limiting reagent was consumed and antimony what's left over is the excess amount. So this is a long drawn out process for calculating the limiting reagent, but I, I think it makes the most sense in my opinion. But of course, uh, there's other methods too and I'm gonna go over one more method. So we're gonna do another limiting re re uh, reactant problem using a smaller amount method. So this, this method is where you convert each mole to product, each mole of each reactant you, you have to product, and you see which one produces the smaller amount, which will dictate um, which one's your limiting reactant. So let's do it for the same example here. Um, so remember, we, we did this uh, example earlier, but we're just going to skip over and see what we mean by the uh, smaller amount method. So what we do is we convert the antimony first to product. So we get we convert it to moles, then use the mole ratio, get grams of antimony iodide. What we get is 532. What else we can do is, so now let's try iodide. So how much of the product can we make with iodide as our reactant? So we're going to do the same thing. And what we get is, is this equation. So now we get moles of iodide, use the mole fraction, mole ratio, sorry, to get antimony iodide. And what we get at the end is 503 grams antimony iodide. So you see here that our, um, our antimony uh, produced from iodide, so not iodide, iodine, sorry. So it's iodine. So see here, it produced only 503 grams of product, whereas the other reactant antimony produced 532. So the smaller amount of product formed gives us our indication of the limiting reactant, and that is iodine. So we only have enough iodine, iodine to produce this amount of product, we, but we have enough antimony to produce that amount of product. But since antimony is present, uh, produces, since, I, sorry, since iodine produces only 503 grams, that is our limiting reagent because it can only produce that amount. So now we are going to solve um, for the amount of the element that remains, which is antimony. So we convert iodine to antimony in grams. So what we get is the same chemical reaction. So we use the mole ratio and what we get is 122 grams of antimony. So now we're going to subtract that from our initial antimony amount. Because um, what, what we're calculating is the amount of antimony that reacts with the iodine because that's a limiting reactant. So what's ever left over is the X. So the difference is the excess reagent left. And you can see here, it's the same thing we calculated before, which is uh, seven, uh, seven grams of antimony left. So that's um, so a big uh, excess of antimony left. Okay. Um, 
All right, guys. So that that is it. I hope that wasn't too bad. But um, please do the homework for extra credit if you like. If not, please just review these slides for Chapter 10. Um, hopefully, um, they were okay. But um, that is the extent of what will be on the final exam. Um, sorry, I had to be rushed like this, but um, um, I think that's where the final exam will stand at. So I covered everything that you need to know. Please take the rest, use the weekend to study, and please, please get into study groups if you can to help you guys out. And if you need have any questions, always ask me and let me know. I'll be happy to answer any questions. So we're not going to go over these energy slides. That is it. So these will not be tested. So don't worry about um, these energy units. Just worry about limiting reactants and those two methods I, I taught you. Excuse me. Sorry. Excuse me. Just those two methods I taught you. Um, one, using the lesser amount of moles to calculate limiting reactant. Or the, um, the, limiting re the lesser amount of moles is also called the... Um, um, when we use that table to kind of figure out um, our limiting reactant, that's called the ice table method which stands for initial change and end. Um, so that you can use that table if it helps you organize the information. I kind of find, uh, uh, kind of find it, uh, it just makes more work and it doesn't necessarily help me, but um, you can use that table method that I went over if you like that I showed you. I didn't really go over it in detail, but it just explains what's happening in, in, in a more organized fashion. Um, and the other method, of course, calculating the small amount of product produced. So two things you want to know is be comfortable using moles, mass, molar mass to convert from grams to moles, then moles to grams, and uh, writing chemical equations, the correct chemical equation to describe the reaction and to also um, convert from one amount of compound to another amount, uh, to another compound in the chemical reaction. So knowing those foundations will, you'll have an easy time with stoichiometry, but stoichiometry is confusing, I understand. So please take the time to really prepare for it. You can expect it on the final exam and you might expect it on the placement test. But, all right, everyone, that is it for this, this class. That is it. Um, all that's left is the homework review and I will grade your extra credit assignments as quickly as I can. Um, yeah, um, I'll see you next, I'll probably see you next time on the final exam, so study hard. Um, it was a pleasure seeing you every time at the, uh, on Zoom for the quizzes and the exams. And um, let me know um, if you didn't have a good experience, um hopefully um it has been an eye opener on what you need to do better um to, you know in order to you know handle a college uh science a, uh, a science course because you know the information is always heavy um there's always other classes you're responsible for so time management is also key and um hopefully this was a good experience to kind of experiment like what a college class is like before you actually take a class of WARF units that will affect your GPA. But um, this is an example of how a chemistry class is run. So hopefully it was um, a good experience and um, I'll prepare you for your future chemistry courses. Uh, but if we don't see each other again after the class is over, I wish you the best of luck. And, um, and uh, you know, as always stay safe and uh, I'll see you on the day of the final exam. All right, everyone, bye.